We're here to talk about common threads. No one is more in a common thread situation than our guest we have here today. Uh, my friend John Noseworthy is a world-renowned neurologist who is the CEO of a $9 billion company, the Mayo Clinic System. Three clinics, including one nearby here in Scottsdale, Rochester, and Jacksonville. Uh, he is a man who is not only a great physician, but he's a great CEO. They have uh, more than 4,000 physicians who work for them. Uh, we have 3,000 students and uh, interns and, and residents who are there, and some 50,000 other employees. So John is in all the intersections of the common thread, because nothing has an impact on society and the welfare of society more than health care, society feeling good about where they are, planning for the future, and being able to pay for it. We're going to talk today about some of the obvious situations that you're all thinking about from a political point of view, and then we're going to talk about the future and what you ought to know individually and what you ought to know collectively about where we're going and how we're going to get there. John, we're in the midst of a revolution, we know that, with affordable care. Where do we stand right now with affordable care and the impact that it's having on the delivery of health care? Well, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Eric. It's great to be here. Uh, we have an unsustainable health care system that is underperforming, uh, and it's up to us to fix that and create a sustainable, high-quality health care system that our citizens uh, deserve and expect. Uh, and uh, there are a few groups that can lead that change. Uh, we have to do it cooperatively. I would say this audience is an, an, an enormous, has an enormous opportunity and obligation to help us do that. It's going to take attention to detail and science and discovery and execution and so on, but it's also going to have to take a look at the future and say, how do we create what people want to be healthier, to take control of their lives, make good decisions, and also hold us accountable, but actually candidly reward those of us in healthcare who deliver excellence at affordable rates so that, we can, so that we can be successful going forward. So it's a very exciting time to be in healthcare if we seize the moment and do what we need to do. There is a division in American healthcare that is becoming sharper all the time between nonprofit institutions like the Mayo Clinic and, as all of you know, the for-profit hospitals, whether they specialize in cardiology or in, uh, in eye care or whatever it happens to be. What's the impact of affordable care on that division? Well, at the moment, as you saw in the Wall Street Journal, August 27th or something of that nature, uh, Moody's re released a report, but that the, the not-for-profit sector, where most of the academic medical centers sit, Mayo Clinic is a not-for-profit, the majority of them are seeing tremend tremendous slowing of their revenue growth, and expenses are outstripping revenues. Revenue growth in the not-for-profits is at an all-time low. And so folks are suffering, and that's leading to bad decisions, but necessary decisions, layoffs, consolidations, mergers and acquisitions, and it's hurting healthcare uh, in general, and it's hurting those who work in healthcare. We're defunding the National Institutes of Health, although that's been stabilized a bit uh, in recent uh, months. But it's t the not-for-profits are struggling. Mayo Clinic is doing well, and candidly, I'm proud of that. I don't want to draw a big target on our chest, but we've, we're doing well because we put in place a plan to make sure that we could be successful. As a not-for-profit, all of our income is reinvested in our staff, in technology, in education and research, and we're growing the future both in terms of face-to-face -face care, but also remote care and digital, the digital world that you're all helping to create. <laughs> We're funding the practice and we're funding research. We're funding, we're funding healthcare and we're investing in wellness, which is what folks want. And we ultimately want to create a situation where we, Mayo Clinic, and we'll help others and hope others will do this as well, will develop a meaningful relationship with people wherever they live in the world, whether we ever see them or not. We want to keep people well, we want to share what we know with people, that's our humanitarian side. We need to create a business model to support that and to supplement the reduced revenues that are coming from insurance companies and, and candidly, patients. Uh, but that basically will create the future. Why are nonprofits suffering more than the uh, for-profits? Uh, because somebody can walk in with a card and you have to take them, and the nonprofits, I mean, the profit cr group can say, we're not going to well, take there's a number of reasons. a number of reasons behind that, Tom. First of all, the for-profits are agile and they're business-focused. And even though many of the 
the, many of the for-profits work in the Medicare, Medicaid zones of large city hospitals and so on and do good work. They have one mission and that is to deliver health care to those who need it and the fact that Medicaid and, uh, is now mandated in 25 states, roughly 27 states I guess, they're actually getting paid for something they weren't paid for before. They don't generally support research and education and so they have that advantage. The not-for-profits are generally less nimble more rooted in the past, and candidly, they haven't moved as quickly as they need to to get ahead of what's coming. Uh, long term, part of the reason that we have uh, a national health care plan, the Affordable Care Act, is that we had to do something about the perpetually rising cost to the rest of the economy. 17.5% of our GDP goes to health care. Are we seeing a diminution of that at this point? And what about, based on the first two years of experience, what we're likely to see is we project out two more years. The rate of rise in healthcare spending has slowed, as we know, and that was for a number of factors, and lots of folks have studied that, and there's not a single answer for it. The, um, the American public, with coming out of the recession, uncertain about healthcare, and beginning to recognize that they are gonna be responsible for more of their out-of-pocket out costs, are accessing healthcare systems less. People are staying home because they're unsure of how they're gonna pay for this. Plan design has helped to drive that as well with the high deductible uh, uh, insurance policies that folks are streaming to. They can, affect, they can buy their insurance, but they can't pay for their deductibles. In other words, I, I can afford insurance, I'm glad I have insurance, but if I get sick, I can't pay for it. So folks are staying home. Uh, that's, that's a big part of it. Uh, I think the uh, Affordable Care Act has done something positive in terms of driving groups together, hospitals, doctors, insurance companies, uh, others, to improve the efficiency of health care, put in place preventive services and population health management for people in, generally, in general who, have, who are basically well or have one or less chronic conditions. What the Affordable Care Act didn't do, and hopefully the next phase will, is understand that when people get more than a little bit sick, have more complex illness, that the, those who look after them should be rewarded for managing complex illnesses and providing better results at lower cost. That's not really emphasized in the bill. So we've looked after the base of what we call the pyramid primary care, preventive services, and a little bit of population management, and that's been a good thing. And that has driven up efficiency and driven down cost. Healthcare is safer in part because of it. The industry was changing before the Affordable Care Act, but the Affordable Care Act has done that pretty well as a start. But it hasn't taken advantage of the opportunity to, now how do we lead, how do we innovate, how do we invest in better outcomes at lower cost for patients who have complex illness? The puzzle of chronic disease in this country is really pretty important. 5% of the American public are responsible for 49% of the healthcare costs. And we have to find a way to manage folks who have one or more complex conditions. Those who do, if you have two or more, diabetes and hypertension, cancer and Parkinson's, whatever those are, they cost seven times more than a healthy person. So there's an opportunity here to do something that's pretty great. But at the moment, it's basically the base of the pyramid we've looked after. There's very little in it to motivate people to be well. It's coming. And also to have a sustainable business model to be the leader in science and technology and so on. And that's what, that's what we're working toward. You've been on the job, what, five years now? Five years, yeah. Tell us about the difference between when you first took the job and now, in terms of the time that you're spending on the role of technology and the kind of technology that brings us to this stage in delivering health care and making an assessment of what the needs are. So the, perhaps the path to my being assigned to be the president and CEO began in about 26, uh, pardon me, 2006, 2007, when we looked ahead and said, what should the Mayo Clinic be in 2020? And that was a trustee mandate. I think it was just before you came on the board, Tom. Are you, are you preparing for the future? And I had the opportunity to lead that. And in doing so, and looking ahead and seeing where is the money, where is health, what's gonna happen to this country because we have an unsustainable system, we began to put in place the ideas and then fund the infrastructure for how does Mayo Clinic not only be a place where people come 
but how do we use our knowledge as an integrator to address the problems nationwide and bring the information to people wherever they are? That basically set our strategy for the next, uh, basically the next 10 years. When I came into the job, the physicians didn't really understand what was happening in healthcare that there'd be less reimbursement, people were gonna stay home, there'd be consolidation in the industry, there would be great disruption in the industry, and that we would be at quite vulnerable as a place where people travel. People come from 130 countries to the Mayo Clinic, all 50 states. With narrow networks, regulation, insurance industry coming together, we are vulnerable to, to not having enough patients coming to see us. So my job has been essentially to convey the platform that we have ahead of us and then to turn it over to the staff to say, what are you going to do about this to innovate to create higher quality care at lower cost? And that's the excitement of the, of the job. But all of you who are involved in this kind of thing, change management is a big part of our lives these days and it's been a big part of my life. We've moved to, we've made investments. We've done well the last five years, and we use that money to invest in our future, whether it's individualized medicine and the human genome and that possibility, whether it's regenerative medicine and stem cells to help our patients uh, recover, whether it's using engineering principles to improve the quality of the care but reduce the cost. Uh, all of that has helped us move to a leadership position and share that more broadly. So it's been understand what's out there, invest in the future, invest in technology, and as I say, we're doing well at the moment and we have a chance to lead. A lot of you may not realize that the Mayo Clinic has been there for 150 years in Minnesota. It was founded originally by a Civil War surgeon who came back to Minnesota and his two sons uh, joined him in the practice. They converted it to a nonprofit enterprise and it did become the holy grail of healthcare. And then in the uh, early part of the 20th century, they had a colleague who was not only a great physician, but he was a genius at management. And so the uh, male model is unique in healthcare because it is in its own way, just the management of patients, holistic. Anytime you go there and you're dealing with a specialist or someone who is just your primary care physician, or there are people who are gonna be giving you tests, everyone is looking at the same screen at the same time and talking to each other all day long during the course of your treatment. Why that is not conventional practice in American medicine is, uh, to me, still a, a mystery, John. Uh, if, if I could make a comment, Tom, I think the reason we've been successful for 150 years is basically we, sh we have a common core belief, and that's that the needs of the patient come first. And it's not a slogan, and I think you've experienced it when you've been there. You've mentioned that to me. I certainly have. The entire team gets up every day to put the needs of the patient first. So we have a an enormously talented and committed staff, and that culture is terribly important. We have to use that culture to change how we work, and that's difficult. But we decided we can't scale that culture. We've grown in Arizona, we've grown in Florida, but it's difficult to, to grow that culture more widely. And so we've taken advantage of this digital world, codified our knowledge of how we worked, and have created scalable knowledge tools to knit together a less fragmented healthcare system in this country with 30 affiliates. But that core belief of the needs of the patient and the, the staff that we have who bring that forward, that's why, we're, that's why we've been successful. We've never lost hold of that, and it's, it, you feel it when you're there. So that's a huge strength. I don't want to break it, I don't want to break that, but we do need to make some changes if we're gonna, if we're gonna be uh, successful. Most of the people in this room have the resources and live in areas where they can have access to great health care, but a lot of America depends on community hospitals and rural areas where they can't get to a first-class hospital system under affordable care, under the changes that are going on, what happens to community hospitals? Well, the, the American Hospital Association have said that they're, they're probably going to see closure of 10 to 20% of community hospitals be full of patients, but inadequately reimbursed and insufficiently efficient to stay open. That's probably gonna happen. Part of that's the fragmentation in healthcare, and many of us have experienced it. The doctors don't talk, the systems don't interconnect. And that's part of why we've gone ahead and created our knowledge tools to link these hospitals together with the Mayo Clinic so that the, the, the decisions that are made are the right decision for that patient that gets patients better, safer care, and hopefully will keep many of these hospitals 
open. They're vibrant and they're important for their local communities. Healthcare is often the largest employer in a small town. Another way we can help them be successful is through what we call e-health, if you will. E-ICU, electronic ICU. So at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, we have a, 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 a CAPS, a, a, what am I trying to say, a, a, a command center where our physicians and nurses can watch all the patients in the intensive care units in the rural hospitals and work with them to intervene earlier and save lives. And in doing that, we've reduced the mortality in the community hospitals intensive cares by close to 50%. We can help a surprisingly distressed, healthy newborn, if you will, in a labor and delivery in a rural hospital that was thought should go well and save a life by using mobile technology to get into the, the delivery suite immediately and help the physician and nurses provide better care. We can deliver consultations and immediate decision making to rural America for folks who come to a rural hospital with a stroke and literally within one minute have a neurologist interacting with the doctor and the patient and deciding whether or not they need thrombolytic therapy. It, it, there's a lot we can do. Now we can't get paid for that because that's practicing across state lines. So there's a lot of regulatory issues that we need to, we need to um, uh, continue to work with. But this, as again, this audience, it's all about your future and your ability to help us innovate and influence and move things forward so Americans will get affordable health care. We had a, a traumatic experience in our family. We had a traumatic experience in our family this year. My a younger brother, uh, we lost Alzheimer's. And it made me so much more conscious, even though I have been, I suppose, in a more journalistic, abstract way, aware of the impact it's having on society. But when it hits home, uh, you're aware of the emotional cost, the financial cost of it, and the consequences of a downstream for a family. There are a lot of issues that are attached to the aging population, not just that. Cancer is more likely to appear after age 65. How much concentration is there at the Mayo Clinic and in healthcare generally about preparing for this tsunami that is coming? Well, you would expect that an institution like the Mayo Clinic has a very vibrant research program to deal with this, and we do. But at, at, at the national level, and President Obama drew attention to this, insufficient funding for research is a key issue. Insufficient funding for Alzheimer's disease is an issue. We spend $200 billion a year in this country and 600 billion globally to manage the one person in three in the elderly population who will die of dementia. And we're investing way less than 1% in that in finding new ways to detect, prevent, and, and ultimately cure Alzheimer's disease. So it's an area that we're known for. We have a very active uh, program in place to try to understand using genetics and, and behavioral uh, sciences and so on to understand individual risk for that, how we can mitigate that risk, how we can identify the pre-symptomatic phase of Alzheimer's disease, and then to intervene with uh, treatments that may work. Uh, we've just discovered a, a new protein that marks whether a patient with Alzheimer's change will actually be symptomatic. It doesn't matter if you have the Alzheimer's pathology if you're not symptomatic, the TDP41, uh, I think it's called. And again, we don't know much about what that'll all mean, but discovery science, investing in excellence, investing in innovation, that's where the country needs to go. And that's what Eric and Laura were talking about earlier on. Are you seeing any evidence of progress in obesity? Oh my goodness. Uh, it's the biggest risk to our children. It's the biggest risk to our future. Uh, it's getting worse. Uh, Mayo, five years ago, decided to invest in health health and wellness, and nutrition, exercise, and making the right decision are critical to the future. We're investing in that. Eric and I had a discussion at breakfast today about whether we need to uh, move more quickly with that. Uh, but that's the biggest risk to your children and my children and grandchildren is the obesity epidemic. Um, think of a, a Mayo Medical. I'll give you a moment to do that because I'm going to share one with this audience as well. Uh, I was diagnosed a year ago with a cancer called multiple myeloma, and it's going to turn out OK. Uh, but it's been a hard year. And then I had a call two weeks ago from a woman who was treated at the Mayo Clinic who was down for the count, frankly. It, she'd had 10-year experience with multiple myeloma. She developed, it's a bone as well as a blood disease. And she developed a tumor on her forehead. And uh, she had a lot of bone damage. And her future was very dim indeed. And at the Mayo Clinic, they invited her to be part of a two-person uh, clinical trial. 
in which they gave her 10 million doses of a measles vaccine. They injected her, and it was her only chance. And an hour later, she got tremors, she had a migraine headache, she had nausea. 24 hours later, she walked out of the hospital. She's cancer-free at this point. Now, that's a unique experience, but that's the kind of innovative, bold work that is done at the Mayo Clinic, and it wasn't just a Hail Mary. They knew what they were doing going in. Do you have any other of the Mayo Clinic uh, kind of miracles? <laughs> <laughs> so just stop that, John. <laughs> so it's, it's a, it's the fir- these are the first two examples of oncolytic viral therapy success in patients with disseminated cancer that have been witnessed in science, these two patients. Advanced disease, end-stage disease, and using an engineered measles virus that lyses, that kills that specific tumor, literally made them tumor-free. Now, that, it was a Hail Mary, but behind that, as you might expect, was 15 years of science trying to understand how we engineer the cells to do that. It's, a, it's clearly a directional shift in where we need to go and gives us hope to invest further in that. I think the story of Mayo Clinic, in terms of what we do well, lies in getting the diagnosis right. If you're ill and you don't have the diagnosis right, you will suffer and it's, a bad, it's bad for you and for the economy. There are t- countless stories, and Mayo's not the only one that does this, I'm not suggesting we're better than others, but one story that stands out in my mind was the story of a little girl in the Pacific Northwest who was unable to stand without fainting. She would be sent home from school because she was nauseated and throwing up, and her parents went to five different major medical centers in this country and were told that your child has a psychiatric illness. The child lost 70 pounds and was down below 70 pounds, and clearly she was dying. Her mother, searching the internet for cases like that, came across a YouTube from the Mayo Clinic on POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and a discussion of what it is and how it's misdiagnosed. Three in the morning, she was, her child was dying at home. She called the Mayo Clinic the next morning and said, I just saw this on the internet. Oh, that's Dr. So-and-so's office. Was connected, talked to the secretary, and said, I, I'm, I'm up here in the Pacific Northwest. Would you like to speak with Dr. Fisher? She said, I never expected to talk to Dr. Fisher, Dr. Phil Fisher. She was connected to him. They talked for a few, few minutes, and he said, well, I think your child does have POTS. Can you come? When would you like to come? The child came. The diagnosis was confirmed. And within three weeks, she was gaining weight. She's now back at school and doing well. There are countless stories like that. And the thing is, you have to get that precision of the diagnosis if you're going to make a difference with people. One other quick one that we like to talk about is a, is a young man who's 28, and he had had no life because he was diagnosed with a psychiatric illness and he'd been to many, many places and nothing they could do could get him back into society. Medications didn't work, multiple medications didn't work. He finally, as a Hail Mary, came to the Mayo Clinic. We did pharmacogenomics testing to understand his P450 chromosomal system and recognized that he metabolized medicine at a different rate than others and we're able to adjust his medication, and now he's at college, and he has a full life. And his mom tearfully says, now my child has a life. That's the kind of thing that we need to have in this country, not just at Mayo Clinic, obviously, but at any major academic medical centers. We have to be leading the fields nationally, internationally. This is the country for innovation, taking technology, helping our patients, moving forward, investing in the NIH, partnering with industry, partnering with entrepreneurs, partnering with benefactors to create an exciting future. We've said that... (laughs) Thank you. So when I talked to the medical school, first day class, and said, you know, this is what we do. We've done it for 150 years, people coming here, getting patient-centered, physician-led teams, needs of the patient. But what we want to do is have a meaningful relationship with 200 million people, share what we know in a humanitarian way, help them get, stay well, and so on and so forth. Hand went up, young woman said, why are you limiting yourself to 200 million people? Great question. 
And I said, well, it seems like a good place to start. We can see a million, a million two, maybe a million five face to face, but we should be sharing what we know globally. The initial video we saw about saving the planet, that's the way we feel about medicine and our commitment to our patients and making it a better world, so. And let me just uh, close on two notes. One is that uh, you all have a role in this, not just in your own personal wellness, but also as we move uh, ever more swiftly into the cost factor of healthcare and how we deliver it uh, across the spectrum uh, in American society and for that matter around the world, you have to be aware of what you're getting and what you're paying for it. My guess is, and I'm not to ask you to raise your hands, my guess is that everyone in this room knows what they paid for the last automobile, flat screen television, for the mini iPad. My guess is that 90% of you have no idea what you spent on healthcare in the last year if you stop and think about it. What went out of your pocket, what your copay paid for it, and we've got to get invested in that as well. And on the final note, I'm a public trustee here. It's been outside of my work and my family, obviously. It's been one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. And Eric is also on the board, and although he's not gonna be happy about me including him in this conclusion, we like to think that Google thinks of itself as the mail of the internet. So on that note, we'll say thank you all very much for being here.